Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. From what I've heard outside, I understand there's a lot of energy in this room, uh, the type of energy that's really needed to uh, create a future and get Europe uh, moving again. Let me thank my good friend and colleague, uh, Erki Katenen, Prime Minister, for the uh, invitation here and to the Centre for European Studies uh, for hosting what I consider is an important uh, seminar. We may well be in the last weeks of the Irish Presidency, but as I've said uh, on many occasions already, we will continue to work as Presidency until the very last minute of our Presidency uh, to advance the agenda that we set ourselves uh, within the three pillars of stability, growth and jobs for this Presidency. Um, today, I'd like to say just a little about what we've been able to achieve, what lies ahead, and also to address a number of the uh, wider uh, themes touched on the discussions that you have been having here at the Centre for European Studies. The economic crisis that Europe has experienced in recent years has been absolutely profound. It has affected us all differently, whether in Helsinki, or in Dublin, or in Athens, or anywhere else, and has been fundamentally um, altering aspects of how the European Union actually works. It has taught us the critical necessity of closer economic coordination in a currency union, and the very real dangers of overspill from one member state to another. We've strengthened the Stability and Growth Pact, making it easier to enforce the rules and to give them real worth and value. We have adopted the legislative six-pack. As presidency, we have been able to finalize agreement on the two-pack, strengthening budgetary coordination and enhancing, enhancing mutual uh, surveillance so that we can better see trouble uh, as it arises in the time ahead. We have the European semester process that will result in binding country-specific recommendations on reforms to be adopted by the European Council when it meets later this month in June. And these should guide the actions of the Member States in the time ahead. Uh, member States across the un Union are now more seriously engaged than ever before, and may I say in a more credible way, in implementing unprecedented national reform plans to restore competitiveness, financial stability, growth and confidence <coughs> in their long-term fiscal sustainability. It was important for us as Presidency to oversee this process in a way that made it meaningful and that facilitated genuinely deep engagement between the relevant organisations and personnel. I believe that at this point we have succeeded we have enacted the fiscal treaty that puts the need for sustainable budgetary policies on a sound and irreversible legal footing in member states. And I would remind you that in Ireland, we fought and won a referendum on its contents in May of last year, despite the harsh economic conditions that applied. We've established the European Stability Mechanism, ESM, as a credible and a permanent backstop for countries in difficulties. We are working to ensure that it can also play a role in any future banking crisis. The various union institutions, not least the ECB, have played their part in restoring stability to a currency that just 12 months ago was seen to be under very real threat. Where it has been needed, creativity and innovation have been found. So as we look to the future, we should at least allow ourselves some brief reflection uh, and indeed some pause for some satisfaction on what has been achieved collectively and together. While we've had many difficult meetings in the past, the ups and downs when push came to shove, when the market wolf, as they say, was at the door, the European family did pull together in keeping with its finest traditions. And as a result, we've made some significant headway on that uh, first Irish presidency goal, which was to restore stability. But while stability is an absolutely essential prerequisite, 
it is just a first step. There is absolutely no room for complacency in the time ahead. The steps that have been taken have provided us with some respite. They have provided investors and the European public with a sense of increased confidence that the currency is durable, that it is not going to collapse, and that we will do everything necessary to stand behind it. It's demonstrated that member states are pursuing sustainable fiscal and economic policies, and that if they do so, that they will be supported. But there is no escaping from the fact that we continue to face very significant challenges indeed. Without recovery, without growth, without most especially job creation, the stability that we have wrought cannot be regarded as necessary, lasting or secure. There is absolutely no room for slacking off here. That is why this month's meeting of the European Council will be such an important one. Uh, when we meet at that meeting, our focus will be on driving reforms, on implementing the Compact for Growth and Jobs adopted last year, on pressing forward with banking union, on strengthening EMU, and most especially with getting to grips in a real way with unemployment. Can any leader in the European Union stand up with any degree of satisfaction in the knowledge that 26 million people <coughs> are unemployed across the 27 states? There are simply no more vital topics and there are no more, no need for delaying or denying their urgency. Last week we heard from the Commission on the steps that each of us need to take at national level to boost competitiveness and to make our economies more dynamic. As Presidency, we will now work to see that these recommendations are adopted by Member States. For Ireland, this means continuing with the difficult programme of reform that we have been involved in and engaged in in recent years. I'm here to tell you it's difficult and it certainly is not popular. In Ireland, in our country, we've implemented unprecedented deficit reduction measures equivalent to 18% of our GDP, equivalent to all, almost 15,000 euro per family. We've taken actions to recover much of the competitiveness that was lost during the credit fuel property bubble years. And many of the measures we've had to take have been very painful and very difficult for the Irish people uh, who have responded to this crisis with both pragmatism and resilience and for which I again thank them. We've cut social security taxes on employment and VAT on labour intensive services. We have protected public support for research and innovation, so important for the future. We have avoided increasing direct tax rates on income and business profits. We have reformed the restrictive labour market practices that existed. We have overhauled sectoral, sectoral wage setting mechanisms. We've liberalised previously closed professions and we've cut public and private sector costs. So as a consequence of all these, cost competitiveness has improved by over 20% since 2009 uh, compared to uh, a number of other situations. So we're now ranked by independent studies as the second most attractive country globally for foreign direct investment. We are ranked first in the Eurozone for ease of doing business, and indeed we are ranked first globally for the availability of skilled labour. Recovery, let me say to you, is slow and it's a painful journey, but it is ultimately the only way of dealing with this uh, problem. It's very clear that national measures, while essential, are not sufficient on their own. We also need collective action to drive growth and to drive jobs. And as Presidency, we've had the privilege of being able to achieve uh, progress in a number of important areas, uh, but there is always room to do more. I wrote recently to every European leader colleague to secure their support in a real uh, push in the final weeks of our term, highlighting a number of areas that I consider as being very vital and important. In Banking Union, we have made credible steps towards delivery 
of the commitments that were entered into uh, on the decision of the 29th of June last year. As Presidency, we were pleased to be able to secure agreement on the single supervisory mechanism, which will now enter into force in 2014. We were also able to conclude work on the Credit Requirements Directive, which will ensure that Europe's banks are better positioned to withstand any future economic shocks. <clears throat> but a key remaining step for our term is agreeing on the Banking Recovery and Resolution Directive, which I fully believe remains within our grasp. We have to and want a final package to present to the ECOFIN meeting later this month. We also want to keep to the June deadline for agreement on the Deposit Guarantee Directive, which was reiterated by the European Council at its meeting uh, last March. Banking union is a necessary part of a functioning currency union, but making it a reality is a litmus test and a credibility test of our capacity as leaders, given the responsibility of delivering on the commitments that we have made and entered into. We promised that we would break the vicious circle between banking and sovereign debt, and we cannot do that without a genuine functioning banking union. And any intention of letting the pace slacken would damage our credibility and undermine the fragile confidence that has been built up. So as we approach the anniversary of the Compact for Growth and Jobs, we also need to do more at European level to boost employment, especially for the young, and to help our businesses grow in each of our countries. There are new and creative ideas being advanced on how we can get investment flowing in the real economy, building on the increased capital that we have provided to the European Investment Bank and working in an innovative way with the ECB. Some of these could have an important part to play in targeting youth unemployment in particular and in helping our small and medium enterprises to grow and to create jobs. In February, as presidency, we were able to achieve agreement on the youth guarantee. Now we need to translate that agreement into practical arrangements on the ground. I was able to speak to Prime Minister Katainen about this as Finland is a pilot country in respect of the youth guarantee and youth, youth employment. And as uh, President Van Rompuy pointed out, uh, our June meeting later will be an opportunity to mobilize efforts at all levels around one single shared objective to allow an opportunity for motivated young people to get back into work or to get back to uh, continue their educational studies. So we need to deliver the six billion euro for this work, which is promised in the union's new budget to consider whether that should be front-loaded uh, to deliver impact where it is most needed. But to be in a position to do so, we need first to secure the European Parliament's assent to the multi-annual financial framework so that it can be in place on time. It's our mandate as presidency to negotiate and discuss with the European Parliament who must give their assent and their approval to the budget as is a requirement arising from the Lisbon Treaty. The presidency team, headed by myself and my deputy prime minister, the Irish for, word for which is Thonishta, Eamon Gilmore, will leave no stone unturned until our efforts achieve a successful conclusion and a positive outcome. But we do so as agents of the council, and we can only succeed with the constructive engagement of the European <coughs> Parliament's team. Now, I remain hopeful that we will get there, but I have no illusions, no illusions whatsoever, about the difficulties that are involved or that, for whatever reason, arise. We will, however, continue to give it everything between here and the end of this presidency. I would like to see it concluded and across the line. There are also proposals in the area of the single market that could make a real difference if we are able to unlock them. Proposals on professional qualifications, on public procurement, on e-identification and signature, and the posting of workers. Many of these, as you know, are highly complex and very technical, and they, they create a great deal of disagreement. Difficult to draw them all together. We need to get them over the line, however, and uh, it's my belief that we can also make a significant improvement here on trade, which I regard as a really fundamental engine of growth in the weeks ahead. In February, 
The European Council called for a real push on agreements with key partners, prioritising those that contribute most to growth and jobs. In April, Ireland organised the first informal meeting of ministers dedicated entirely to trade matters with a particular focus on the United States of America. There are sometimes <coughs> decisive moments uh, when the time is right for a truly bold step forward. I believe that this is one of those times, and that's why I believe that the transatlantic trade and investment partnership in the, with the United States is a measure of very significant potential. The forces on both sides of the Atlantic are aligned here. The European Union sees the potential, and at the highest levels, the US is engaged. President Obama actually referred to this specifically in his State of the Union address. There may never be a better opportunity in a global sense in dealing with this and dealing with it now. So our aim is to achieve a negotiating mandate so that negotiations can begin formally after this presidency. The goal is historic. It is of major significance. It is also practical and achievable and can be, can be brought about provided the right political will is there to do that. I appreciate that there are many sensitive issues involved here for a number of countries, probably all uh, member states, and as presidency, we are working and will continue to work hard to address these. But we shouldn't allow concerns to become obstacles to what everyone agrees would be a transformative agreement with enormous potential for growth and jobs for all our peoples, up to two million jobs plus in Europe, the capacity to grow economies by two, three percent. There are some who have argued that the European Union has been damaged and has been weakened by the crisis that it has faced. I don't accept this argument, and I don't believe that it's true. Certainly, there are, there are some among our citizens who have lost faith, and we need hard uh, we need to work hard to regain their trust and to prove it by implementing decisions in the interests of the, of the people of the Union uh, and the Union itself. Fundamentally, however, the European Union is stronger. We have shown that we can work together to overcome some of the most severe difficulties that we've ever faced. We've equipped ourselves with new tools to face the new challenges of the new future, the Union's values, including the very central one of solidarity, has prevailed. This should give us some strength and some heart for the difficult challenge that lie ahead. Building recovery, generating growth, creating jobs, these are the key fundamentals for a prosperous future. Uh, the opportunity to give of our best to the Presidency. We also know that Lithuania is now prepared uh, and ready to go and looking forward, I'm sure, in many ways, and maybe not in all ways, <laughs> to receiving the torch of presidency for the future. I've no doubt that with, the, with their capacity and our capacity to help them and work together for a bigger, better, more peaceful and more prosperous uh, European Union, these are the objectives that are worth fighting for. These are the objectives that I believe in. These are the objectives that I know can become a reality. Thank you very much indeed.